Welcome to this online service from St Mary's Chalcombe and St Stephen's Lansdowne, two churches on the northern side of Bath. And I'm bringing you this service from Primrose Woods, a community-led and cared for woodland just below St Stephen's Church on the same hill. My name is Andrew Avramenko. I'm the curate for both churches and priest to you all. And it's an honour and privilege to welcome you to our online service today. It's an informal one, one of the readings and the sermon that we share together uh, with those in church and online. And also with some prayers to help connect us with God and prepare us for the time we're ahead of us as we look over the time that has gone. As we're speaking, as I'm speaking to you from this woodland, you'll hear the sounds of creation around us. The birds, people walking their dogs, all kinds of sounds that we all hear. And I pray that they will add, not diminish, from this service. But let's open our service properly with prayer. A prayer that we will explore through our gospel reading and the sermon. So let's pray. God of unnatural wisdom, you gave us Jesus our Rabbi to question the roles we play, the submissions we enforce. May your living truth free us from the lie of exclusion and make us all learners and doers of your word, through Jesus Christ, teacher and liberator. Amen. Now our first reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Colossians, the churches in Colossia. It's chapter 1, verses 15 onwards. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope you have been promised by the gospel that you have heard, the gospel which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel, and I'm now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that I was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And our second reading, our Gospel reading, is taken from the Gospel according to Luke. Continuing on, Paul's talking of teaching. And Jesus teaching Mary and Martha and others. 
So Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, they entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. And before I bring you a message for this week, let's pray once again. Lord, I pray that the words that I speak are the words that you want to be heard, you want me to speak. And the words that are heard are those words that you want to be heard. I ask this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week we heard the parable of the Good Samaritan and the person who helped someone he wouldn't have expected to. The Samaritan challenged a stereotype. Excuse me, I saw something. So as I said, we were looking at the Good Samaritan last week, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the person who helped someone that he wouldn't have expected to. The Samaritan challenged the stereotype. And this week we've heard of someone who didn't help someone they would have expected to. And through, though last week's gospel passage was a fictional story, and this week's Gospel passage is an account of an event, they are nevertheless connected. Both are stories with hidden meaning. The meaning in this week's passage may be hidden far greater to us than the meaning hidden in the parable perhaps, but that's not their connection. What the connection will, will is will hopefully become clear. I wonder whether you ever find yourselves identifying with the person in the story that turns out to be the one in the wrong. I'm not talking about identifying with serial killers in Nordic noir thrillers or supervillains in a spy movie. More the everyday person who seems to me making all the logical decisions and saying what you'd say in a similar circumstance. And if I'm honest with myself and you, I know that as I, much as I wish differently, I see something of myself in those who didn't stop to help, help the, Samaritan, the man the Samaritan stopped, because they were too focused on the busyness of their day. I've been that person too, and when that happens I find myself wishing that I had stopped and been the Samaritan I realise I should and could have been. The lawyer who Jesus shared the parable with could see who was the good one he should be aimed to be, even without Jesus pointing it out. But do you ever find yourself struggling to understand and agree with Jesus when he points to who we should be like? For a long time I was in this camp with the parable of the prodigal son and thought it was perfectly reasonable for the brother who stayed at home and, being, and was loyal to his father, to then feel aggrieved at his brother being welcomed home from wasting his inheritance and with a big hug and a party. And despite understanding the celebratory embrace as an example of God's grace being extended to even the most seemingly undeserved people, such examples can still rankle. 
for me at least we have another one of those readings those sort of stories in our gospel reading today after all Martha is doing a good thing in welcoming and serving Jesus and the other visitors to her home and Mary sure it's good to welcome and chat with visitors but not excusing herself to help with getting the food and drinks ready that's perhaps not just lazy it's disrespectful and unfair maybe Martha like the prodigal son's brother is seemingly totally justified in feeling aggrieved and perhaps one way that we might identify with Martha is because she echoes the instructions that Jesus gave to the disciples that of being received and eating the food prepared for you earlier in chapter 10 of Luke's Gospel just before the parable of the Good Samaritan and this sibling disagreement between Mary and Martha, Jesus tells people to sit, eat and drink in the houses that receive them and offer hospitality. Martha is that hospitable host, welcoming and feeding Jesus and the rest. Yet when G Martha pleads to Jesus to intervene, Jesus sides with Mary. That had to hurt Martha just as we might be hurt if all our efforts in being hospitable were similarly dismissed. So what is Jesus really trying to tell us? Is it really that we shouldn't bother making guests feeling welcome and comfortable and fed? But maybe we're supposed to simply sit down and listen to them. No, Jesus is commending Mary because she has seen what is important in the situation and prioritised it. She's prioritised what God recommended, not what the world expected. So what were those expectations that Mary was challenging? Well, to sit at someone's feet was to be their student. And there was no sense of learning for learning's sake in that society. Sitting at the feet of a teacher like Jesus meant that you wanted to teach others too. But in Mary's culture, women and men rarely mixed, and a woman would never sit with a man in the presence of a teacher. Their present place was in the kitchen to serve the men. By neglecting to assist Martha, Mary is violating a clear social boundary of her time and in the eyes of that society was bringing shame upon her house. Neglecting Martha was one thing, but sitting with Jesus? That was another challenging, con controversial challenge to convention. Mary wasn't just a woman trespassing in a man's world. She was publicly claiming equality. And she was claiming equality because she recognised the priority and importance of connecting to listening to and feeding on God's presence and word. Martha, on the other hand, might hear Jesus in the background, but on focusing on what, and fulfilling what her society expected, she's distracted from fully hearing, receiving and digesting what Jesus had to say. Her tasks, duties and distractions Act like weeds and thorns that stop God's word and presence taking root and maturing in her. Just as Jesus says in Luke chapter 8 verse 14, the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures. They do not mature. It isn't only that by conforming to the expectations of society that Martha loses sight of what's important and needed in the situation. She also distances herself from God. Not only does the quality of the task that she is attending to suffering by virtue of her stress and annoyance of Mary not helping, the quality of her life is suffering too. The same is true for us. When we are swamped by tasks and expectations, the tasks and the expectations suffer. Mistakes are made, quality suffers, 
people burn out. No one wins except the one and the ones who want us to fail. By letting herself succumb to society's expectations of who she should be and what she should be doing, Martha not only distanced herself physically from Jesus, but distanced herself spiritually from him. And as she focuses on meeting worldly expectations, she increases, increasingly loses sight of why she is doing what she is doing. She fails to see what is wanted and what is needed for her guests and for herself, just as we can when we are overwhelmed by the tasks and expectations that we face. Jesus wanted them to all feast, not on food, but on his words, words that would transform who she was and what she did. Mary had managed to take a step back and get a clearer perspective on the situation and what was being called for. Her society's valuing of hospitality was laudable, it is, but that didn't mean that she had to conform to its expectations of how she should be hospitable. Mary and the parable of the Good Samaritan voiced Jesus' protest against the rules and boundaries of the culture in which he lived. Both Mary and Samaritan represent marginalised people and therefore unlikely heroes. They act as metaphors to expose the injustice of social barriers that categorise, restrict and oppress oppressing various groups in any society. And both act as teachers, the Samaritan teaching the lawyer and Mary teaching others as Jesus wanted. Just as Jesus wanted equality in receiving and realisation of his good news, he wanted and wants equality in the teaching and preaching of it too. We are not meant to equate Mary and Martha's story with being, with being is good and doing is bad. We see that in Jesus telling the lawyer, challenged by the parable, to go and do as the Samaritan did, and then praising Mary for stopping, being and listening. The Samaritan exemplifies seeing and doing just as Mary exemplifies being and listening. They're not contradictions. When they, held, when they are held in balance, they complement and improve each other. They are both about the boundary breaking call of Jesus. Now, you might be expecting me to conclude by focusing on breaking boundaries between powerful and marginalised groups, but I'm not going to do that. The message that I heard when I prayed and wrote with these passages was that what we need to be left with is focusing on the balancing of doing and being. The social code for our time is task orientated. We judge success by measuring what we have achieved and done. How many tasks we have completed, how much money we have learnt, how many people we have at our event or even in our church. It is all too easy to focus on the things which need to be done and realised and then neglect what Jesus and God wants us to do and realise that the quality of our tasks, achievements and lives matter. When there are things to be done, putting them off for a while in order to spend time in God's presence to discern what is really needed can not only feel counterintuitive, but feel downright wrong and impossible even. And to be honest, it's one thing that I struggle with. As a priest, I'm called to model what Christ would have us do. I'm called to practice what I preach. But preaching Christ is an awful lot easier than modelling Christ. Doing is a lot easier than being. Being Martha is a lot easier than being Mary. 
there are a few, a few occasions where we can't stop and take a step back. Even when we're, sorry, there are few occasions when we can't stop and take a step back. Even when we're frantically busy and stressed. It might be that to take a step back means simply to pause, take a few deep breaths and pray before heading straight back to something that's urgent and important. But as we consciously connect that pause and prayer with God, we won't simply be breathing in oxygen, we'll be breathing in the Holy Spirit, both of which will help us gain a clearer and calmer and Jesus perspective on what we are facing. Jesus doesn't want us to stop doing, but to balance it with being. He wants us to realign our focus. He wants our focus to be that balance between the two, so that the quality of our lives and the things that we do improve and transform our lives and the lives in our society. Amen. going to have a time of our intercessions now, our intercessory prayers. Now we're in the time that's called ordinary time. It's partly because the weeks are numbered, in order, they're put in order. We put our lives in order, but it is, there is no such thing as ordinary. Every day is extraordinary. But let's pray into this ordinary time. And the response to the words, Lord, in your mercy, is hear our prayer. So let's pray. Lord of the Sabbath. For most of us, this is an ordinary Sunday, like many before and probably many to come. We're here because we're normally here, not necessarily because we're looking for something or expecting very much. Take us now in our very ordinariness and shake us up and pour us out and make our hearts beat a little faster as we reach out in holy fascination to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of creation, we admit that sometimes we can miss the glory and grandeur of your created world. We can walk through life with our senses turned off. Give us, we pray, the gift of caring contemplation, so that we may see all things shot through with your glory the morning sun between the houses, the endless shades of darkness in the evening sky, the image of Christ in the face of a friend. And sometimes, let us see things that are so beautiful, they almost make us afraid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations. We know that peace doesn't seem likely in Ukraine, Yemen, Syria and far too many other places. But in this world, surprises constantly catch us out. The surprise of an entire political system collapsing before the freedom of the human spirit like we've seen this week. The surprise of captives merging from kidnap with their lives and hopes intact. 
the surprise of forgiveness and the person who lays down their gun. So Lord, we do dare to pray for peace in Ukraine, Yemen, Syria and beyond. And that justice is the basis of that peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of our shared lives, we live too much for ourselves, islands of self-sufficiency and an ocean of needs. We fail to help the needy and we fail to receive their gifts. We fail to see beyond our own little world. Help us out, help us to venture out to encounter others in their struggles and in their generosity. We bring to you now both someone we know who's struggling and someone we know who's celebrating. Help us to be aware of them and help them to be aware of you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the ordinary, give us eyes to see the deep mystery of ordinary things, ears to hear your quiet thunder, hearts to stir to the promise of resurrection. So transform our week ahead, that we may constantly glimpse your glory and respond with joy. Reveal to us the extraordinary depths of every ordinary moment, and in that moment, transfigure us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let's collect our prayers together with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I hope you, are, you have a good Sunday ahead of you, that the weather is glorious for you and not a struggle. And I pray that this service has been helpful for you in your worship. Do get in contact with us at St Stephen's or St Mary's. Links are in the description below. But let's end, if we may, with me giving you a blessing. The love of God be the passion in your heart. The joy of God be the strength when times are hard. The presence of God, a peace that overflows. The word of God, the seed that you might sow. And the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer and comforter, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you. Take care. And goodbye.